Oh, Dharma Pranam, I just saw the Maharaj joined. Please accept my hands. Hare Krishna, Shyam Kishore, Hare Obeisances. Where is Yugala here or is he hiding somewhere? He is Maharaj, he is serving on the altar. Okay. Well then I can't punish him for that anymore. So Maharaj can share the words for today? Yeah, okay. Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dwaita Chandra Jaya Gora Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Dwaita Chandra Jaya Gora Bhakta Vrinda Taksape Kaliya Jamilila Anukrama Evikahi Balalila Sutre Ta Sutre Ra Danana Translation, I have already briefly spoken about the pastimes of his birth in chronological order. Now I shall give a synopsis of his childhood pastimes. Vande Shri Chaitanya Krishnaya Vande Shri Krishna Krishnaya Alalilam Manoharam Laukikim apitam misha chestaya valitantaram. Translation. Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the childhood pastimes of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is Lord Krishna himself. Although such pastimes appear exactly like those of an ordinary child, they should be understood as various pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Srila Prabhupada's purport. In the Bhagavad Gita 9.11, this statement is confirmed as follows. Avajanati mamudham manasim dhanamasritam parambhavam majananto mamabhutam maheshwaram. Fools deride me. When I descend in the human form, they do not know my transcendental nature, my supreme dominion over all their beings. To execute his pastimes, the Supreme Lord, personality of Godhead, appears on this planet or within the universe like an ordinary being or a human child, yet he maintains his superiority as the Supreme Lord. Lord Krishna appears as a human child, but his uncommon activities, even in his child, like the killing of a demon Puta, Putana and the living of Govardhan Hill, were not the engagements of an ordinary child. Similarly, although the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya, as they will be described in this chapter, appear like the activities of a small boy, they are uncommon pastimes impossible for a human, ordinary human child to execute. On the Gyan Timidandas Yagyan Arjuna Salakana, Chaksun Militam Yenatas Mai Shri Guru Venamaha, Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Kristaya Bhutai, Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Goravani Pacharin and Yerushay Sasunyavani, Pastyatya de Sutarini. Manchakalpa Taru Vishcha, Kripa Sindhu, Pay, Pacha, Patitanam, Pavane, Yo, Vaishnavi, Yo, the Mahomaha. Jaya Sri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadakar, Sri Vasudi Gaur, Bhakta Vindam. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. 
Krishna Krishna Hari Hari, Hari Rama Hari Rama, Rama Rama Hari Hari. Hmm. As Prabhupada illustrates with this particular verse from the Bhagavad Gita 9-11, that uh, people mistakenly think that when the Supreme Lord comes to the material world, he takes out a material body. Or when he comes, they classify him differently as an ordinary person or maybe an extraordinary person, but not as a Supreme. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, only by undivided devotional service can I be known as I am standing before you and thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. Scholars, religions, religionists, philanthropic personalities, academic and ex people who are expert in academia, a lot of them like to speculate and give their interpretations and their writings about the nature of the Supreme Lord. It's like trying to lick, taste the honey by licking the outside of the bottle. The honey remains untouched, but the activities of trying to take the honey looks like something is happening. But actually, it's nothing. It's Shrama Eva Hikavala and has no value. Unless one is engaged in devotional service, one cannot even begin to understand the nature of the Supreme Lord. Krishna says in another part of the Gita, um, which is similar to the verse that Prabhupada just gave, Naham Prakasha Sarvasya Yoga Maya Samadvitaha. Mudo yo abhijananti. Basically, avyayam. Basically, what he is saying, the same thing. Uh, people try to enter into the mysteries of my understanding, but there's a curtain of maya covering them. And they can't penetrate that curtain because that curtain keeps them away from the understanding. But still, they try in different ways to interpret, understand, and speak about and write about the Supreme Lord. And they're never correct. So such writings are simply a waste of time and a deviation from the actual reality. And when Krishna descends, he keeps his transcendental body. He doesn't take on a material body. And his activities are always divium. They're never, although they appear to be ordinary, they're not. And even within the so-called ordinary activities that he performs, there are many extraordinary things that, as Prabhupada writes, that cannot be seen in ordinary children, such as lifting Govardhan Hill when he was seven and a half years old. Um, and knocking down two gigantic trees, Arjuna trees, while he was tied to a grinding mortar when he was about three years old. Uh, many other, when he killed a very powerful witch simply by sucking the poison out of her breast when he was just one year old. So, so many extraordinary activities that he performed as a child and so people who have a poor fund of knowledge, who do not want to acknowledge that this is the Supreme Lord, say that these activities are, are mythology. There's somebody's in, inter, interpolation or, or interpretation in order to excite people's interests. But actually these are factual events that can only be performed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he does it for his own pleasure and for the pleasure of his devotees and to benefit religious principles. So unless one is situated fully in devotional service, 
we can theoretically accept everything that Krishna does as the Supreme Lord, but we can realize it when we have fixed in pure devotional service. And that fixation awakens two things, detachment from all matter and transcendental knowledge of the nature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And in his baby form, in that particular manifestation of his personality, is the most difficult for people on the outside world to accept because the activities are superhuman. And therefore, all they can say from their poor fund of knowledge is that it's mythology or exaggeration in order to satisfy a certain ignorant class of people. But we know that Krishna is divyam. He is transcendental and he is all powerful. Whatever he does is according to his transcendental nature. Uh, as he says in, in this particular, they do not know my transcendental nature, my, my dominion over all that be. So people want to relegate God down to the, a human level, or they want to dismiss the idea that this is actually God. But devotees understand that Krishna can do anything. One time Prabhupada was in London and he was giving a discussion with a very intellectually highly, uh, what we say, what's the word? These people were uh, professional intellects. It was a particular society in London called the Mensa Society. And their business was to take difficult philosophical teachings and sit there and discuss it and try to understand it from different angles of vision. They were, you know, armchair intellectuals. So they came on the request of Sham Sundar to meet Srila Prabhupada because Prabhupada was eager to meet different groups at that time. And so he was uh, preaching Krishna conscious to what we say, people who had some position in the material world. And so Prabhupada was talking about the all-powerful nature of the Supreme Lord, that God is all-powerful. There is nothing he can't do. And he was going on and on describing the Lord's complete all-powerful nature. At one point, one of them asked a question and he said, and it wasn't really a question, it was a trick question. He said, can God create a rock he can't lift? Now, if you say yes, that means he you minimize his lifting power. And if you say no, you limit his creating power. So any yes and no answer limits the Lord. But Prabhupada, he's a pure devotee, and he is highly in touch with Krishna. So he knows everything, and he also knows how to deal with such so-called philosophical expressions. The Prabhupada said, yes, Krishna can create a rock he can't lift, and then he'll lift it. And then he'll lift it. So, and just to show that, you know, even from the inconceivable, absurd aspect of questions, you can't somehow limit Krishna in any way because he's all powerful and his, his pure devotee is constantly aware of the all powerful nature of the Supreme Lord. So, and he performs these pastimes as a little child for his own transcendental pleasure. The nature of God is that he is Rasavai Sai, that he is full of loving relationships with his devotees in different moods. And as a little child, he's in the mood of accepting correction, protection, and, uh, and uh, rewards from his parents. So he's in, his parents are in the mood of Atsaya Ras, which is one of the more glorious Rasas in the relationship to Krishna. 
So in that in that relationship, Krishna is giving pleasure to his devotees by acting in different ways as a naughty child, as a sweet young child, as an obedient child, as a cute child, as a tricky child. In other words, all of the characteristics that an ordinary child may have, but in a very sweet way, Krishna is performing his activities for the pleasure of himself and for the pleasure of his devotees. But from the non-devotees, they can't penetrate. Even if they have great philosophical carriers, great learning abilities, been to many colleges, have graduated with so many different degrees, it doesn't matter. It's still licking the outside of the bottle. Only those who engage in devotional service will be able to understand a little bit about the nature of Krishna. You can't know Krishna in full. Prabhupada says it's impossible to know God in full. Krishna also says that in the Bhagavad Gita, I know everything that's happened in the past, all that is happening in the present, and all things that, that are yet to come. I also know all living entities, but me, no one knows. So Krishna speaks this verse in the Bhagavad Gita, in the seventh chapter, explaining that I know everything, past, present, and future, and I know every living entity completely. Krishna is situated in the heart as super soul, so he's constantly with each, with each and every living entity. So he knows the, everything about that living entity. He knows more about that living entity than the living entity could ever know about themselves. He is completely all cognizant and all good at the same time. And so he's situated in that way. But then he ends the verse by saying, me, no one knows. So the philosophy of Krishna consciousness or the, the tattva or the, not, the uh, characteristic of Krishna consciousness is to try to know Krishna. Prabhupada said we should make an effort to know as much as we can about Krishna. Because Krishna is all attractive. And as we know more about him, his pastimes, his qualities, his forms, his names, his activity, everything about Krishna, everything, we will become more and more Krishna conscious. And that's the actual goal, is to absorb your mind in Krishna. <laughs> and that means absorbing your mind in serving Krishna, but also hearing about Krishna, yeah. Speaking about Krishna, remembering Krishna, all of these awaken attraction for Krishna, which comes by having knowledge of Krishna. The more you know about Krishna, the greater your attraction for Krishna will, will, will uh, increase. So that's Krishna. But the non-devotees, because they try to understand God from their own mental abilities. They don't take knowledge from Shastra. They don't take knowledge from Guru. They don't take knowledge from Krishna himself. <clears throat> they take knowledge from their own speculations, their own intelligence, and their own, what we say, hypotheses, which they form and then break apart and then reform again. So they can never know the Supreme Personality of God, and no matter who they are, no matter how great they are from a material perspective. <clears throat> but even the simplest devotee who has faith in Krishna and hears about Krishna can know Krishna more and more. And by knowing Krishna, that is ultimately leads to love for Krishna. And love for Krishna is actually the goal of Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> So, but these, uh, but this verse is indicating that uh, Krishna, he is, he bewilders everyone by his activities. And even devotees sometimes doubt you know, what Krishna does. They also say a lot of them is interpolate, interpolations. Something is added and something is changed in order to make it a, uh, what it seems, what it is. But actually, it's not. All of this is coming from pure Shastra or from the pure devotees 
who are fully engaged in devotional service to the Lord with devotion. So when we hear Krishna's pastimes or read Krishna's pastimes given by the pure devotees of the Lord, not only do they give the pastimes, but they explain things in such a way that we can understand deeper what Krishna is doing, why he's doing what he's doing, and what is our relationship with Krishna. And one who fully absorbs himself in that can also associate with Krishna in these pastimes. So this is Krishna consciousness. <laughs> it's the doorway to understand Krishna. Otherwise, Prabhupada makes that point. There are, and there is, this is not a minority. There the majority of the people want to know God without trying to serve God. And they have so many ideas of what God is. But <clears throat> none of them have any value. <laughs> Unless they hear from a representative of Krishna who is in line with Krishna in the Sutric succession. So we should understand that Krishna is <clears throat> all powerful. There's nothing he can't do. There's nothing he can't change. Prabhupada said Krishna is so powerful, he can make day into night and night into day. So we can't even figure out what that means, what to speak about uh, imagining what it looks like when it happens. <laughs> so this is Krishna. He's, he's you know, way beyond anyone's ability to understand. And he's perfect, and he's also very merciful. His mercy is that whatever he does, he does for the benefit of everyone, not just some, but everyone benefits by whatever he performs. His activities emanate out and permeate the entire world with auspiciousness. And of course, his mercy also. So this is Krishna. So therefore, the devotee should hear and chant and read more about the glories of the Lord and his different leelas. And every year we put an emphasis on Bal Leela, Krishna's baby Leela in the month of Dhamadar when he performs his activities as Makan Cho, stealing butter. He acts like an ordinary child, steals butter, eats the butter, lies that he actually does it. When he gets caught, he cries and says, it's not my fault. <laughs> so this is Krishna. <laughs> and if you think otherwise, then you are seeing in a, in a material way. Krishna is all powerful and he is the, he's all sweet. Whatever he does has an element of sweetness to it, which brings about even if he kills demons, he's smiling while he does it because he knows it's the be for the benefit of the demons also. So that's Krishna. <laughs> so we want to hear more and more about Krishna, get attracted more and more to Krishna, learn more and more about Krishna. That is Krishna consciousness. The nature of the conditioned soul is that, or any soul, is that they like to learn things. And so many times we waste time trying to learn things in the material world. And we could be using that same time to learn about Krishna. <laughs> and Bhagavatam is the best doorway to opening up the knowledge of Krishna. Everything there is in Srimad Bhagavatam. And in the case of Lord Chaitanya, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Chaitanya Bhagavat, we have an ocean of transcendental knowledge that we can never exhaust for hundreds of lifetimes, just the books that Prabhupada has given us is enough to keep us absorbed in Krishna for hundreds of lifetimes. <laughs> and none of the knowledge is limited. It's always dynamic. That means that even if you read and hear the same pastime over and over again, you get newer and newer understanding, newer and newer realization newer newer experience of the nature of Krishna simply by connecting with 
any particular pastimes over and over again. So this is transcendence. So why waste time with other subject matters? There are so many things in the material world. We call this material world a world of names. <laughs> There's no nothing behind a name. It's just a way to, to describe or indicate something. What is the meaning of a name? Sometimes a name does indicate something, but other, most of the time a name is given just to give us some exclusivity. Otherwise, it's just the world of names. Its names change and nothing else changes as the names. It's like Prabhupada said, if you read the newspaper, you can see, you'll, do, you'll hear about some politician is corrupt, some war is going on, somebody died, somebody was born, it was a marriage, with some financial interchange. And then you read the newspaper 10 years later, the same things are going on, but the names changed. That's it. <laughs> the world of names. That's, all it is. That's the material world. The substance that we're looking for is found in Krishna and hearing about Krishna and his pastimes. It charms the heart, elevates the mind, and awakens one's attraction for Krishna. So whatever you hear, whether it's Krishna's Baal Leela, his Paganda Leela, his Kakaishur Leela, or any of the Leelas, they're all what we say, Ananda Chinmaya Ras. They are full of transcendental happiness and transcendental knowledge. Okay. Hare Krishna. Mara, should we go to the next verse? Hmm? Should we go to the next verse? Um, oh, yeah, well, I was thinking we open it up for questions. Okay, Maharaj, we'll open it for, up, open up for questions. Um, anyone has questions, you can raise your hand and I will unmute them. Maharaj can or ask. comments or anything. Um, Maharaj, I have a question. Can I ask? Of course. So it's an amazing class, Maharaj. Um, you mentioned that how uh, licking the outside of a bottle is Shrama Evahi Kevalam. So uh, I really love that statement. And um, how to make sure that when we're in, when I am I am personally engaging any devotional activity. How to make sure that I can actually go deep into the devotional activity and taste instead of just licking the outside of the bottle, like so to speak. And this is called prayerful reading, reading in a very prayerful mood. Or reading with the mood of trying to understand, not just reading. Read the words on the page, but the, the words also have deeper and deeper indications. So read in such a way that you want to understand exactly what you're reading. So sometimes we say, read it and then read it again, and you'll see, you may be able to get more each time you read it. So prayer for reading, um, reading with a desire to understand, both of these uh, ways are ways to approach the Shastras. Hearing in the same way, practice hearing in, in an attentive way. Attentive means don't let allow the mind to wander away from the, the sound vibration and keep your mind fixed on what is being said. When you do that, that, not, that sound vibration goes into the heart and it helps to either give you two things. It either awakens realizations about what is being heard. In other words, you understand and accept what you're hearing as a feature of knowledge, or you get questions. 
So if you're hearing or reading and you're not getting either questions or realizations, then you're not going deep. You're, not, you're just giving the surface. So we should, we should look for either realizations or questions as we read. And that requires absorption, both in the hearing process and the reading process. Reading is another form of hearing. Also. So these are indications. Are, am I getting questions on what I'm reading? Am I getting realizations on what I'm reading? If you're not, not getting either one, then continue to go back over and read again. And this is from Padma Purana. It explains the process of hearing or the process of receiving transcendental knowledge awakens either one of these two features, either realizations or questions. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Um, can I ask one more question? Did you get that one? <laughs> yes, Maharaj. I noted these two things that uh, one should get realization or one should get questions. And if that is, is not. This is very important. If devotees could accept and understand that particular point, then they will be able to get much more from the process of Krishna consciousness. Yes. So, um, Maharaj, my next question is, um, sometimes the mind is uh, not so much interested in absorbing in devotional service, like the mind is not very cooperative due to whatever reason may be. So at that time when the mind is not interested in being absorbed, so what prayer or what can I take shelter so that the mind... <laughs> well, we all have a mind and we all know what it's like when the mind doesn't want to cooperate. The mind will play tricks. It'll wander to other subjects. Or if you force it, it'll go to sleep. <laughs> it does whatever it wants in order to avoid what you want it to do. So there is a, a series of prayers by Raghunath Das Goswami called Manashiksha, prayers to the mind. <laughs> Uh, these are in the form of verses. And in that he, he conjoles his mind, he instructs his mind, he entreats his mind, he berates his mind. In other words, he approaches the mind in different ways. So... We have to let us understand that the mind is not us. It's simply a series of impressions and experiences that come by way of our interaction with the material energy life after life, which are stored in the unconscious part of the mind. And they appear and disappear according to different situations. But the mind in itself is, is what is called chanchala. Krishna, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Arjuna used to, would say chanchala hi mana krishna pramiti balabhadridha tasyaham nigamam maye vayar ida karam. Arjuna, after hearing instructions from Krishna about controlling the mind, he makes this statement. And what is he saying? That the mind is turbulent restless, unsteady. It's very difficult to control the mind. And then he ends by saying, I think to control the mind is like trying to control the wind. And Krishna in the next verse, he says, Abhyasena kukunteya vairagyana chabriyate. He says, yes, what you say is correct, Arjun, but by constant practice, and by detachment from material things, one can control the mind. So here's the formula. Practice controlling the mind by engaging the mind 
and detach yourself more and more from material activities. If you allow your mind to wander, it will go to where it wants to go. And generally it goes to something in this material world. And uh, so the mind actually controls us rather than we control the mind. But Prabhupada, I mean, Krishna says, you have to practice engaging that mind in devotional service and at the same time, detach yourself from engaging in material activities. Then he says, you may be able to control the mind. <laughs> It's very difficult. You can be thinking, you can be chanting Hare Krishna and then the mind will go on a particular thought and that thought will lead to another thought, which will lead to another thought. They're all the thoughts are connected with each other. And pretty soon you're in a completely different atmosphere. That's how the mind works. If you're chanting and you see something, that sight might bring rec recollect a particular experience, and then that experience is remembered, and then the experience may take you away from, it will take you away from your chanting. So the mind is chanchala. It doesn't, it's, it just goes this way and that way. So you have to practice controlling the mind. So hear more about Krishna, chat more about Krishna, remember Krishna, engage in devotional service, and don't listen to the mind. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says, your mind is a non-devotee. That's a pretty strong statement. Your mind is a non-devotee. And so we know we're not supposed to associate with non-devotees. So if we're associating with our materialistic mind, we're in the wrong association. We're in bad association. So we have to make the mind a devotee. And then when you associate with the mind, the mind is supporting your Krishna consciousness, not taking it away. Thank you so much. Anyone else has any question you can unmute and ask? Hmm? Okay. Mara, it seems like nobody has any any other questions. Sure. Right. If there's anyone that wants to ask any questions. We have 25 devotees online. No, no we have 30, 33 devotees there. Maybe I can ask one question if you allow. Uh, let's see. Uh, we, ha question. we have Raj. Raj is going to ask a question. Thank you, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. Okay. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada. And then we have Shamananda Krishna next and Sri Devi also next. Uh, Maharaj, you said uh in in your class that we should try and learn as much as we can about the lord say that again uh, i um i'm gonna have to uh make a little adjustment here because i'm at the temple and there's a loud kirtan going on right behind me Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, now I can hear you better. Okay, good. Thank you, Marge. You said in your class that uh, 
we should try and learn as much as we can about the Lord. So there's obviously many ways of learning about the Lord. And there are many forms of the Lord that we can learn about. Is there any particular form and method that you would recommend? Otherwise, I feel like lost in this ocean of there's so much, so much choice. Well, Prabhupada emphasizes that that form and it's worshipped by Lord Chaitanya, Sri Krishna and Vrindavan. He says we should focus on that form. He says we are we are devotees of Kishore Krishna, which means Krishna in his youthful age. We worship Krishna as Baal Krishna also, but Prabhupada emphasizes as our society, Krishna, Lord Chaitanya worship Krishna in his his feature as Kishore, the beautiful boy of Vrindavan, who is the paramour of all the gopis, the friend of all the cowherd boys. So Prabhupada made that point that there's where we should put our attention. Of course, it's not wrong for the other leelas or the other manifestations of Krishna, but he said, as followers of Lord Chaitanya, we worship Kishore Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. There you go. Nice picture of Lord Chaitanya. That's nice. Shamananda Krishna, Prabhu. Maharaj, Dandar Pana Maharaj, Aglarishla Prabhupada, Aglarishla Prabhupada, Maharaj. Maharaj, my question is. Uh, I am trying to very care. I am trying to be careful to avoid offenses. Yet in many uh, situations, I myself is not aware how I am committing offenses because I can see from my own chanting that there are many things that I am not doing right that I should be doing right. So my question is how to overcome this phase, Maharaj. <laughs> Well, that's the process of Krishna consciousness is to weed out those things that are contrary to our progress in Krishna consciousness. As we see them, as they appear in our activities or in their minds, our minds, that we don't feed them by allowing them to stay. We just push them out and add Krishna to our life. So the process is a transformation from material consciousness to Krishna consciousness. So it's a pro it's a gradual process, of, <clears throat> and uh, Sanatana Goswami explains that one should know what is favorable for devotional service and accept that, and one should know what is unfavorable and reject that. So when you see something unfavorable and you and it's clear that it is, then you just reject it and don't give it any further thought. Just push it out. We don't develop, dwell on the negativity. Now, when it comes to offenses, we should be very careful to act in the proper way. So Vaishnav culture means Vaishnav behavior. And when behavior is in line with the proper etiquette, according to time, place, and circumstance, that means you behave accordingly, wherever you are, then um, you won't commit offenses. We should also learn how to apply Krishna consciousness when we're at home, when we're at the temple, when we're in the general the assembly of general people, when we are at work. So each one requires a per particular type of uh, activity, which is supportive of our Krishna consciousness. So we have to learn how to apply. Krishna consciousness in each and every circumstance in our life. And when we see something is off or something is not Krishna conscious, we avoid it. And that's called pratikul. Pratikul means don't give it any credit or any attention either. Thank you, Maharaj. 
we do that in material life too. So same thing applies in spiritual life. Do this, but don't do that. Think of this, but don't think of that. Eat this, but don't eat that. Say this, but don't avoid saying that. So that's the feature of the intelligence. Intelligence is discrimination, discrimination based on the teachings given to us by Guru and Krishna. Mm -hmm. Now, if we don't know these teachings, then inadvertently we're going to make mistakes. There's two kinds of mistakes. One is we do the things we shouldn't do, and the other one is we don't do the things we should do. So we have to know both and how to apply it in each circumstance. Well, an easy formula is if you remember Krishna, it becomes easy to understand what to do and what not to do. So that's the easy formula, but Nectar Devotion describes in detail all of these features of what to do and what to avoid. So if you don't read the books, then what can, who can help you? <laughs> If you don't hear the lectures, then how will you get knowledge? Can I ask one follow-up question, Maharaj? Uh, first, tell me what you got out of my answer. Yeah, Maharaj, like uh, um, one is doing things which is favorable for Krishna not doing what is unfavorable for Krishna. And um, two ways, uh, how things are favorable, one can know by hearing from Guru and Krishna, by reading books, and also by always remembering Krishna. And Maharaj, you mentioned that the easy way is, if you remember Krishna, then you'll be able to make the right decision in those circumstances. Very good, thank you. You have, <laughs> you have digested everything perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, Maharaj, my question um, based on Ayurveda, Ayurveda says that you mentioned Ayurveda says the health of the body is based on the digestion of the body. So, when you digest everything and you're able to digest, that means you're healthy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so Maharaj, like how to always remember Krishna Maharaj? Like does it include always chanting Hare Krishna? Like some lectures we also hear remembering the form, remembering the pastimes, remembering the qualities. And how does that happen Maharaj? Well, it happens two ways. By going directly to these, this knowledge and hearing about Krishna's names, names, forms and qualities and pastimes. And the other way is by engaging in practical devotional service. Because if we don't serve, we don't perform service. Although we may be hearing and reading, we generally can't remember. So remembrance will be stronger. And because you're actually pleasing Krishna by doing service, so we have to do practical service also. And that supports the process of hearing and chanting. Krishna says, if you serve my pure devotees, you'll actually get the attraction to hear about me more and more. You'll develop that attraction. And then I, in your heart, will cleanse all material desires, and you'll become fixed in hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. And so it, it, the principle of service has to be... A, as the foremost principle. <clears throat> so some people might say, well, I'm hearing and chanting, and that is service. That is in the higher stages when one has perfected Krishna consciousness, then they can simply hear and chant. But in the beginning stages or in the development stages, we need to be doing service. 
because we have a body, we have a mind, we have intelligence, we have abilities. If we don't use them in Krishna consciousness, we use them for Maya. That's all. <laughs> They have to be used. Maharaj, can you please elaborate on uh, if you serve pure devotees, Maharaj, like how do we expand that? Yeah, um, maybe we can get help from Sham Kishore here. Can you put up a particular verse? From yes, the Bible? Yeah, it's the fir first canto. Uh, chapter 2, verse number 16. Yes, sir. So, Shamananda Prabhu, you can read the verse when it comes up. And then we'll read the next verse and the next verse, and you'll see the connection between uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, the service and hearing. Yeah. These are very, Prabhupada quoted these verses. Translation. Or twice born sages, by serving those devotees who are completely free from all vice, great service is done. By such service, one gains affinity for hearing the messages of Vasudev. Next verse. Mm -hmm. Shri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, who is the Paramatma, super soul in everyone's heart, the benefactor of the truthful devotee cleanses desire for material enjoyment from the heart of the devotee who has developed the urge to hear his messages, which are in themselves virtuous when properly heard and chanted. So the first verse is by serving great souls, we get an affinity to hear and chant the glories of the Lord. When that develops, then Krishna sees that the devotee is, wants to hear more about him, so he cleanses material enjoyment from the heart. And um, the urge to hear his messages become stronger and stronger. And then the next verse, these verses are all connected. Uh, the next verse. Uh, okay. Yeah. And then, then read that one. By regular attendance in classes on the Bhagavatam and by rendering of service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed and loving service onto the personality of Godhead who is praised with transcendental songs is established as an irrevocable fact. So you can see the connection between each of the verses, how one leads to the other and continue on. So now it's mentioned hearing and serving that everything that is troublesome to the heart is destroyed and love starts to awaken for the Supreme Lord. It becomes a fixed uh, feature of the, of the devotee's life. Next verse. You'll see how these verses are connected. As soon as irrevocable loving service is established in the heart, the effects of nature's modes of passion and ignorance, such as lust, desire, and hankering, disappear from the heart. Then the devotee is established in goodness. Then he becomes completely happy. Yeah. So, Prabhupada, when he came over on the Jaladuta, he... He recited these verses in that poem, Bar Markan Bhagavad Dharma. <clears throat> so he, he mentions these verses to show that this is the essence of the practice of devotional service. Next verse. Mm -hmm. I think next one is the final verse. Thus, established in the mode of unalloyed goodness, the man whose mind has been enlivened by contact with devotional service to the Lord gains positive scientific knowledge of the personality of Godhead in the stage of liberation from all material association. Yeah, so now it's taking one to the point of 
gains positive scientific knowledge of Godhead and has reached the stage of liberation from all material association. It all starts by serving great souls. And Maharaj, what are the ways we can serve? Uh, like, does service to pure devotees include uh, serving the Vaishnavas, uh, whom we are in, in touch with, Maharaj, all the devotees? Or what well, are the different ways? That verse says, those devotees that are free from all vice. In other words, those who are on the platform of pure devotional service. So that's generally with the spiritual master or those who are on the same platform of the spiritual master. And how do you serve such persons? You do two things. One, you hear from them. In other words, the knowledge that they have is their way to serve the Lord, and they're giving that knowledge to everyone. So those who take time and are enthusiastic to hear from them, that is a way to serve these great souls. Another feature is offering some personal service, doing something on the practical level. In other words, uh, thinking of ways you can serve. You can use your mind to serve. You can use your resources to serve. You can use your intelligence to serve. You can use your body to serve. So we should, practical service and hearing are the two ways you associate with and serve great souls. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. You read the purports on these verses, you'll see, you'll get a further understanding. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, back to the. Thank um, you, Maharaj, for taking too much time. Help us. Yeah, I see you're sincere, so that's good. That's what's important. If you have eagerness to learn, then it's just a matter of time. Sri Devi. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances or glories to Srila Prabhupada. My humble obeisances to all the devotees. Thank you, Guru Maharaj for this uh, class on the Lord's appearance, his activities, that they're all divyam. My question is about Krishna's verse in the Bhagavad Gita, Janma Karma Jame Divyam. And in India, we find that everywhere people glorify the Bal Leela of Krishna. There are so many songs, dances, dramas, poetry, glorification. You know, Bharat Natyam, Kuchipudi, Odissi, you name it. It's all glorification of the Lord. But yet, in spite of hearing this and, and knowing this for centuries, uh, we don't still take to devotional service. Or people just remain on the platform of piety and don't really go deeper into uh, serving the Lord. Or it's mixed up with... Uh, um, demigod worship, we worship everyone, we worship Krishna also, we glorify Krishna also, and so on. So I want to know, why is it that even after centuries of, you know, contact with Krishna's Bal Leelas, people don't get attracted and get involved in devotional service? Because they don't approach a spiritual master, that's all. They don't see the need to approach a spiritual master. Hmm. As soon as you approach a spiritual master, then you get direction and, and practical guidance and understanding. Then it takes it out of the world of entertainment into the world of serious execution of activities. Hmm. Unless, yeah, and unless the reason come, that they come to approaching a bona fide spiritual master, that will continue to go on. That's, a, that's the way of the world. Even God becomes someone's form of entertainment. 
Wow, that's just mind boggling actually. How many lifetimes can just go like that? So how, well, it's how we can... It's easy. When you approach a spiritual master, you have to commit to follow. And people don't find that very palatable. So they want to continue their material activities and they want to at the same time do a little puja on the side just to just to do it and so they well, don't get some, really attracted there's some piety there but it's traditional to uh, the culture of india is the culture of spirituality so they take spirituality in different forms but even if it's done in an entertaining way it has to be done according to the guidance of higher authority. Otherwise, it becomes what is called sahajya. Sahajya means taking something valuable in a cheap way. It's like if you have some gold and you think it's just yellow rock and you just let it lay around and you don't use it, you don't take care of it, you don't protect it. You're not really understanding the value of what you have. People don't, don't understand that their connection with Krishna is through devotional service to Krishna and not simply uh, a form of using Krishna to try to fortify or support or increase your material life. Just like people, they invite, they invite holy people to their homes. Why? Because it's punya. They get some punya. That means their home becomes a little bit blessed. Uh, so using the holy persons to purify their, their homes. Or they take, they touch the, the feet of the holy persons in order to get some blessings. Everybody wants blessings, but when it comes to service, then few will come forward, not everyone will come forward. Hmm. I see. So Sepa is the indication. Hmm. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna Mahas. Maras Dandatra Mahas. Maras. Maras, can I ask a question? Uh, let me see. Who's speaking? Um, this is Achtabha Pahas, Maras. Uh, no. Where are you? I don't see you. One second, Maras. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Sorry, Maharaj. It's, it was my daughter's name, so sorry. Uh, Maharaj, um, uh, you answered um, we should not make mistakes. Uh, Maharaj, I do make mistakes and I realize I make I made mistake. I, I repent for short term, but again, I repeat the same mistake again, over and over. It's it's happening again and again and again, Maharaj. Um, can you please help me? How, how can I get out of this chain? Well, if it's very strongly embedded in a series of activities, then the way to get out of it is association with devotees and serving the devotees. Then the chain reaction will become slackened and eventually become changed. If it's not so serious, then you just, if it's something that is small, then you can somehow or other see, well, I'm doing, I do this, and because I do this, this happens. So let me not do this, and then that won't happen anymore. <laughs> In other words, change the way you act and think, 
and then you'll get a different result. So we should try to think and act for Krishna or for religious principles, and then we'll always be in the best position. But the association of devotees and service to the devotees is a way to break uh, any kind of, what we say, uh, what's the word, habit that has somehow or other developed. It becomes a habit and you have to really work on it through association and service to the devotees. And it will easily be slackened with no problem. If you associate, then you should serve, not just associate. Those who serve, they understand. Those who chant, they understand. Does that help? Uh, we've lost your volume, I think. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, Maharaj. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Yes, Maharaj. W one follow-up question, Maharaj, if that's okay. With Did you get that one? Y yes, Maharaj. I should I should serve the devotees and uh, um, I should chant and I should uh, think and the way I act before I act I should think and uh, does it help or or not help me or not. Yeah, we're, 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 we're creatures of habit. And we find, we formulate a certain habit based on a certain mindset. So you, you can't break the habit unless you change the mindset. That's what Krishna consciousness is about transforming our consciousness to from material to the spiritual. Yes. Maharaj, when um, you say serve the devotees, because I am contaminated, I have, you know, because of my fault-finding nature, you know, I do offenses while, while doing service. So, um, how should I serve in a way that I don't commit further aparad or you know offenses, and that helps me to change this mindset much. Yeah. Well, if you like the fault find, then you know I had the same experience. I was thinking I would like the fault find, and then I thought, well, the best way to use my fault finding nature is to find fault with myself. So if you do that, then you you can have a, a field day. <laughs> You can enjoy fault finding unlimitedly and you'll make progress based on that. And so turn it inward instead of outward. I just read something just recently on the back of a car. I was, I was driving in India here and I was driving in Bombay. Uh, it says, it says, if you like, if you if you like to find fault with me, then you can do so only if you are perfect. In other words, if you have no faults, then you're qualified to be a fault finder. <laughs> How many of us are, you know, in the Christian tradition? It says. Uh, if you live in a glass house, don't throw any stones. If you break your own house. So fault finding doesn't really solve anything. It just destroys the mind. And then best thing to do is when you see a fault in another person, look for some good quality at the same time. Push out the fault and look for their good quality. Because it's, it's natural sometimes to see faults, but 
when that comes, just divert the tension away and because it's, other people's faults are not important. <laughs> Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says, um, when you see faults in others, look into yourself and see what is about yourself that's becoming disturbed because of another person's fault. Why are you becoming disturbed by another person's fault? Are you their guru? Are you their parent? If you're a guru, you do that to help them. If you're a parent, you do that to raise your child. If you're a teacher, you do that to correct your student. Otherwise, if you're not in any of those categories, there's no, it's just the, 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 the restless mind. So the antidote is when you see faults, look for good qualities. It works. I know I used to be a number one fault finder. I was high on the list. And I'm I now I try to see, well, I also have faults, so I should look into myself and correct them. Because when you correct your own faults, you actually don't see faults in others anymore. Because the faults that we see in others are reflections of our own images. Because the mind is a mirror reflects outside what's inside. If you're unhappy, then everybody looks unhappy. <laughs> when you're happy, everybody looks happy. <laughs> we just talked to Shamananda Krishna about the nature of the mind. So this is another feature of the mind. Dissatisfaction causes one to become uh, critical of others. Thank you, Marcus. Hey, Krishna. I, I don't know your name, but it's it's not a Diti, I'm sure. Yeah. Achuta Gopal Das. Achuta? Gopal Das. Oh, with well, a name like that, who can find fault with you? It's such a beautiful name. Gopal, who was Achuta, wow, that's really, that's one of Krishna's special names. All right, thank you very much, Maharaj, for the wonderful class. And uh, I'm sorry, you know, there is a small confusion. And, you know, because you did class in Gaurapunim, I thought today is also, you know, there's a. Today also, I thought you'll be class at uh, 7.20 EST. So please forgive me, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, well, happy to hear you. I heard you were doing puja, so... I just I finished thinking, it. I was thinking you were very busy and very important service, so... Maharaj, you know, very wonderful class and questioners. I have a question, Maharaj. So, you know, if you're in management, naturally, you have to find fault. Otherwise, you cannot be proactive, right? So then what happens? Otherwise, the problem will manifest. Then you will address it. So, so being proactive means you need to correct others. Uh, how yeah. to make sure we are correcting, but we are not finding fault with them? Well, put yourself in the role of a doctor. Your patient comes and you, your patient is sick. So you think, oh, I'm healthy and he's sick. Well, you're the doctor. <laughs> you don't criticize your patient for being sick. You try to help them. <laughs> yes. Sir.
Yes, thank you. That's a great answer, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Okay, so where's our where's our host? Is there? Oh, we got one from Preeti. Preeti. Hare Krishna, Maharaj, Tandavat Pranam, Jai Shri Prabhupada, all glories to you, Maharaj. I had a question that when I do my office work for the eight hours in the beginning, I remember Krishna, but the rest eight hours I Krishna's thought never comes in my mind. What am I supposed to? Once I finish my work again, I remember Krishna. But during that period, thought take is a not break. There. Take the break during those eight hours and listen to a class or read something about Krishna. Look at a picture of Krishna. Just do something to help you remember Krishna. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Yeah, just mix in your mix in your work with your devotional eight hours straight of office work can be debilitating for anyone. So yeah, just keep a picture of Krishna right on your desk and don't forget it. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, there is one question on the chat. Would you like to take that? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Should I read it, Maharaj? Yes. Mm -hmm. Or you can see it on the chat. Or should I read it, Maharaj? I'm listening. So, Maharaj, this is a question from Dira Chaudhary saying, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, Dandat Pranam, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Guru Maharaj, in India, many people do puja for their material gain, quality. So, by this way, can he attain the actual purpose of human, human form of life? Um, Unfortunately, as you began reading the question, your audio became uh, un unclear. So maybe you can re repeat the question. Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, Dandat Pranam. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Guru Maharaj, in India, many people do puja for their material gain. So if in this way... Have, uh, uh, start at you. Uh, skip the introduction and get right to the question, but read it slow. Guru Maharaj, in India, many people do puja for their material gain. So if in this way, any person is attached with the spirituality, so by this way, can he attain the actual purpose of human form of life? No, no. Anything done for material gain is contrary to devotional service. There were may, there's two kinds of pious people. One who performs pious activities to worship the Lord and others who perform pious activities in order to increase their material life or the benefits from of material life. So if they're in the first category, they can make some progress towards devotional service. But in the second category, they'll never get anywhere. It's a, pi it's a pious householder who is, in one sense, quite self-interested, not interested. Using the Lord or the worship of the Lord for their, for their own material benefit. And they get very little out of that because Krishna cannot be used in a material way. But because they're, do some, they're doing something in the category of piety, they at least they stabilize their material life. They don't gain anything. And eventually they go down after. So anything material, even if it's done in the mode of goodness, will gradually uh, lose its 
effect and then it'll start entering into the lower modes of passion and ignorance. Better to serve the Lord for the pleasure of the Lord. That is devotional service. Anything they do should be done for the pleasure of the Lord. They can't come right to bhakti. They can at least offer the results of their activities to the Lord and his karma yoga. And that'll help them get a foothold in detachment. Once they start becoming detached from their material desires, then they can, gain, they can go to the platform of developing knowledge of the Lord on the platform of cultivating spiritual knowledge and activities in, in pious activities, they start to awaken their attraction for Krishna. And then they look for activities of devotional service. Krishna explains all this in the Bhagavad Gita. How karma yoga can lead to jnana yoga can lead to bhakti yoga. But those who are, when we say, grihamedi, who center their whole life around their home and perform activities for the Lord simply to increase their material success, they don't get anywhere. Maharaj, there is more. Well, Dhiraj, is, was that okay? No, uh, but uh, like in India, they say, if we uh, do this puja, we get this punya. So, uh, like, after that, do they get the next life in human form of life? Or like, uh, that is... It's hard to say. What is the next part of that? They may, they may or may not get human. Prabhupada talks about that. He says, no one can guarantee what kind of birth they get. And Prabhupada was talking today, a person is very, elite, uh, very fixed on being Indian and they're, they're living their life around India. But next birth, they could be a Chinaman, he said. <laughs> You can't, you can't really determine what's going to happen in your next life. Unless you elevate yourself to devotional service. As long as you play around with the material energy, the modes are always competing. And even though you try to stay in the mode of goodness, you fall into the mode of ignorance sometimes in the mode of passion. can't stay in the mode of goodness because the modes are always competing for supremacy. I mean, people are charitable. They're maybe kind on a material level. So yeah, they may get a, they may get a birth in their next life. They may get a human birth in their next life. But what's the use? What's the use of getting another human birth? And going through the same thing again. <laughs> just, you're just wasting time where you could actually be, be serving the Lord in devotion and going back to Godhead, which is the real goal of life. <laughs> so those who are pious, they may also become impious. Yes. Actually, parents do not understand this. So, yeah, because this they think they can, they think them. they can control material energy. No one can the controller of the material energy. Krishna says, "Daiviyeshi gunamai." I control the material energy, not you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. We have another question on the Mahi Pal. Ready.
Sham Kishor, you were the host here. You got to keep this thing moving, not me. I'm not the host. <laughs> I'm sorry, Maharaj. It's my fault, bro. You can ask your question. Maharaj is waiting for you. <laughs> it's your job to keep things going. I'm just here answering questions. I'm not the facilitator. Yes, Maharaj, so if you go to sleep, then what can I do? Sorry, Maharaj. I thought he was asking a question. My pal, Pro, we cannot hear you. Yeah, I think Maharaj, she's... Let me call him, Maharaj. Um, if, if it is getting late for you, we can end, Maharaj. Oh, no, it's, it's only 7 o'clock here. Maharaj Sri Devi Mataji has another question. Uh, Guru Maharaj, this discussion is uh, very interesting. If you don't mind, I have a question. So what happens to people who are pious, they come, they do a little, you know, put money in the hundi, they stand before the Lord, they make their prayers every Sunday or Saturday or whatever day they choose, then they go back home, they carry on with all the other activities, then again every Sunday they come, they do a little, you know, pranams, then they put a little money in the hundi, then again they go back home. But uh, that goes on for months and years. And uh, what's their destination? They are coming to Krishna's temple. They are offering something of their wealth to Krishna. They are offering homage to Krishna by offering obeisances. What does Krishna say? What does Krishna say in the Bhagavad Gita? Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me, and offer your homage unto me. Thus, you will come back to me. What does he say about such persons that you're describing? They never surrender unto me. Well, he says, As you approach me, I reward you accordingly. So they get whatever they put in, that's it. If they go to, if someone goes to the temple every day and offers prayers asking for some material benediction, and someone goes to the temple once a week and goes there to offer devotional service, who's better? The one who's offering devotional service, even if it's yeah. just once a week. Yeah. Obviously. Right. Right. So how can we encourage people, Guru Maharaj, to, you know, step forward and, and enhance their human life and, you know, stop this uh, repetition of birth and death that has been going on for millions of lifetimes? Try to encourage them to chant Hare Krishna. Find ways to get them to chant Hare Krishna or look towards chanting Hare Krishna. Or if you can't do that, just find ways that they can do some service. Like one of the things you can do is you can ask them to do some service to you. Can you do this for me? And since you're a devotee, they're serving a devotee. So they'll get some benefit from them. And if they serve devotees long enough, they'll start to become more attracted to the process. Mm. Oh, I never thought of that. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. Yeah. And somehow we want to connect them to Lord Chaitanya's movement and gain this wonderful, wonderful benefit of going back. You can't home. really. You can't bring people up to the high, a high stage at the beginning. You have to find ways to connect them in some way or another, either through chanting, giving a donation, doing a little service, coming to the temple, taking prasadam. Start them off somewhere. <clears throat> 
Mm. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Just like like we we find a lot of the young kids in our movement, they're not into anything but kirtan. It isn't, and somehow because their friends are, are into kirtan, they also want to emulate their friends. So they learn how to play Vardanga or harmonium. And then they come to the temple and have kirtan programs. So they're attracted to kirtan. They're attracted to what their friends are doing. And that can, that's helping them come closer and closer to Krishna. Yes, Guru Maharaj, very nice. This five-point program I like. Somehow or the other, try to connect them in some small way. And then, yeah. okay. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. You can do that with your family members too. <laughs> I don't know about that, Guru Maharaj. You've already done it to some degree. Keep going. Okay. Thank you. By your mercy. Only it's possible. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Maharaj, Mahipal Prabhu's audio has some problem, so he typed the question. Can I read it out? Please, you're in control, not me. <laughs> I have to ask you. You don't have to ask me. <laughs> Maharaj, the question is, if anarthas are daunting and even intense prayers are not are also not helping, then what else to do? If an artist are daunting, and then how does that go on? And even intense prayers are not helping, then what else to do? Just keep chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and serve devotees. Chant the Hare Krishna and serve the devotees. Do these two things. These are powerful, very powerful forms of devotional service. Krishna says, anyone who serves my devotee is gets my mercy. Anyone who tries to serve me directly may or not may or may or may not give his mercy. Serving his devotees is higher than serving Krishna. Don't find fault with the devotees, find opportunities to serve them. Okay. Maharaj, there are no more questions. Uh, um, can I uh, um, recite a verse to you, you, are in, you are the supreme controller of this program, so whatever you want to do is just a matter of time before it happens. <laughs> I'm just the, the guy that just tries right, to answer the, the question. No, 12th, can, 12th canto, 12th chapter, 50th verse. Is, uh, um, Starting again. Marge, uh, the kata you gave us is uh, like a festival of mind. On so the the kata that you, you gave us is a festival for the mind. So we are all we are is confirmed and extremely grateful to you bring us a festival festival for the mind. Manusama Hotsama. So very, very grateful, Maharaj, for your you. time. My patience is to you and all your, your painstaking. Thank you for your tolerance and patience and, <laughs> and facilitating this. Please program. forgive my offense. You don't commit any offenses. There's no offenses. Not possible. Looking forward to the next class much. Very eagerly looking forward. Thank you. Thank you.
So thank you, dear devotees. We will end here. Yeah. Is is uh, Srimati uh, still online here? Srimati, is do you still here? Is no, here right? I don't see her. Yeah. Uh, Sri Devi, you're still here? Yeah, Sri Devi is here. Maharaj. Um, I'm traveling tomorrow, and it's very unlikely I'll be able to do the regular call. So uh, maybe you can inform um, Srimati, and she can arrange for someone to uh, give the class. Yes, Guru Maharaj, I'll immediately inform her to respond. Yeah. It's 100%. I won't be able to do it tomorrow. I have to travel most of the day. So. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Okay, thank you very much. My obeisance is to all the devotees. Vancha Kalpa, Tarim, Vishcha, Kripa, Sindhu, Vancha, Titanam, Pavane, Yo, Vaishnava, Yo, Namaha, Namaha, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Ki Jai. Jai. Thank you, Maharaj. His Holiness Chandramali Maharaj Ki Jai. 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 Krishna.